So in a moment of weakness, uh, I think that Jason Fung included me in his group, the IDM group, so I'm happy to say I'm a part of that and uh, honored to be a part of that. And also I am a low carb practitioner, I advocate that diet, so that's my bias. So today I want to uh, weave a paradigm of insulin resistance and see if I can stitch it together with EPOE. So a uh, sugar map of the brain. A normal brain has good sugar uptake, whereas a brain that has Alzheimer's disease, the sugar uptake is quite diminished. And I was intrigued by that finding, and I wanted to see in that paper, increasing the sugar of a normal person from 100 to 150 improved their memory and increasing the sugar of an Alzheimer's disease patient to about 225 also improved their memory. So I wanted to find out why this is the case. So I realized that memory is an energy intensive process. It requires fuel and it requires insulin to drive that in and that an Alzheimer's brain is insulin resistant, so it requires higher sugar and higher insulin for it to facilitate memory. And perhaps the reason the brain is undergoing atrophy is because it is fuel deprived. And how can we tie this in with Alzheimer's and ApoE4? So I wanted to study the insulin and the insulin receptor in detail. And here is an insulin receptor. As the insulin binds to it, the receptor goes through a structural change. It activates events inside the cell that leads to formation of the GLUT4 channel that is taking sugar into the cell. Now the brain will take the sugar in and the, the brain or any cell will take the sugar in through this GLUT4 pore and then use it for energy. It can burn it for energy. Or in other cells, when it doesn't need energy, it can convert to glycogen. The same insulin receptor activates intracellular events that lead to the activation of mTOR through which you will make protein. And a brain cell has insulin receptors. And the insulin receptor are highly present in certain areas of the brain, like the hippocampus, like the frontal lobe. And they activate the insulin receptor, not only permitted to take in fuel, but they create chemical reactions so that there is new protein formed that facilitates memory. Now that is called synaptic plasticity because it improves the connection between the brain cells. So what's happening is that as you take in food, the insulin is released and the insulin goes and tells the liver that this American has just eaten a carbohydrate filled diet and the liver, you better get ready to store this sugar or to use it. It goes and tells the muscle, hey, now a lot of amino acids are coming in, let's build new protein it goes and tells the fat cells, hey, let's store fat into our fat cells. And it tells the brain, hey, I really like this sugar stimulus. Let's do it again. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Kraft. Jeff and Ivor had introduced him to the community and it was paradigm shifting. And I think equally paradigm shifting is Dr. Roger Unger because he described the connections, the paracrine control between glucagon and insulin. So to elaborate a little bit more on his work, these are images of pancreas. On the left panel is a normal pancreas. And what you see out there is the insulin producing red beta cells and the green cells are the glucagon producing cells. Type one diabetics, they don't have any beta cells so they don't make any insulin. And type two diabetes has hypertrophied uh, cells uh, in terms of their beta cells. 
But what's important is that there is close juxtapositioning of the alpha and beta cells. And the question that Dr. Unger posed to himself is that, is this an accident of nature or is there a functional role? And I'm paraphrasing him. So paracrine means local control. Endocrine means that uh, insulin is being produced in the pancreas, but it's having effect on the brain. So insulin begins its journey in the beta cells. And the highest concentration of insulin is seen at the level of the alpha cells that are making glucagon. The role of the insulin is to shut down glucagon. By the time it reaches the liver, it is diluted by about tenfold. And by the time it reaches the regular circulation, there is a hundredfold dilution. A burnt out type two diabetic and somebody who is a type one diabetic exogenous insulin can never duplicate this physiologic situation because the liver will never see the concentration of insulin that nature designed for us to see. So why is this the case? And the reason this is the case is that as there is slight fluctuations in sugar, the beta cells release insulin in a phase one response. You see that spike out there, that little squirt the reason that squirt is there is because it can suppress glucagon. And it continues to suppress glucagon through phase two. What it is telling is, is that, hey, in a situation in which you are not eating, this is what glucagon is doing. Because glucagon levels are high, it's telling the liver, put out sugar, burn the muscles and convert them to sugar, take the fat, the glycerol from the fat, convert it into sugar, and take the fat and convert them to ketones. So that's an important role of glucagon. So the paracrine interaction between the alpha and beta cells when you're eating, insulin is telling, hey, use and store sugar, build new protein, pack fat and store fat, on the other hand, in situations of scarcity, it's telling, the glucagon is telling, make and release sugar from the liver, break down protein to make sugar, and release fat, and perhaps convert them to ketones. So this is what we as Americans do. And by the way, I'm going to admit today that I understood several of these concepts wrong. And I didn't, and I think I didn't understand insulin resistance well. So the paradigm that I told my patients is the one on the extreme right of the slide, which is an overflow phenomenon that your cells are sugar filled and you are asking the insulin receptor to drive more sugar into the cells. And I think I was perhaps wrong. And I even used these slides on, with my patients in which I said, it's like a Japanese train in rush hour. It's filled. There are Japanese police that are designed to stuff the train so that they can clear the platform, which is the paradigm of insulin resistance I was going by. But several studies have shown me that the paradigm that is correct is that there is defective insulin receptor or absent insulin receptor so our cells and our brain is actually starved. So the cart and the horse analogy is right. Hyperinsulinemia is the horse, which is created by years of refined carbohydrate use. And when there are high insulin levels, it's enough to downregulate your insulin receptor and cause defective insulin signaling that can lead to the outcome of dementia. So let's explore this further. Persistent and repeated hyperinsulinemia from a, a standard American diet will block the insulin receptor signaling, will prevent sugar from getting into your cells, will prevent your machinery inside the cells from making protein. The insulin receptor goes and hides inside the cells in containers called endosomes 
Or sometimes these endosomes can fuse with the garbage disposal mechanism called lysosome, in, important in autophagy, and destroy the insulin receptor. So that was the picture you were supposed to see of the brain cell which is being activated by the insulin receptor. But something tragic is happening with insulin receptor downregulation. You are not activating the chemical processes that will create and improve the synaptic connections between the cells. You lose memory and you lose brain function in the setting of insulin resistance. So we talked about this phase one insulin response. I think this is one of the most important things in our pancreas for us to protect. Because when you lose that and you become uh, insulin resistant or type two diabetic, you see the red curve showing the loss of phase one response even though your insulin levels go way up and even higher than in a normal situation like Ivor and Jeff have pointed out. So again, this slide was important. It's showing that squirt and the phase one insulin response that provides the paracrine control of glucagon. So here is a hypertrophy type two diabetic beta cells. But what's happening out here is that in a type two diabetic, the phase one response is gone, the insulin levels go up, but it fails to suppress glucagon. Glucagon levels are inappropriately increasing preventing the reduction in sugar output by the liver, so your glucose levels are still high. So it's shown here that this is inappropriate hyperglucagonemia of somebody who's insulin resistant. The liver is still spewing sugar. It's breaking down protein to make sugar. It's taking glycerol to make sugar. The liver is picking up fatty acids. It's exporting them as fat-filled VLDL but the VLDL cannot be packed into the fat cells. It's going to be used to make ectopic fat in the pancreas, in the heart, and in the liver. So Lydia Shishapank, one of the colleagues with Dr. Unger, showed that when you scan a pancreas in a normal person, and then compare that to somebody who's obese, somebody who is insulin resistant, and somebody who's a diabetic, there is a stepwise increase in the amount of fat in the pancreas as you get insulin resistant. So what's really happening is that the liver is spewing out a lot of sugar. It is increasing insulin, but without the phase one response. The glucagon cells are insulin resistant because they're covered with fat. They can no longer see insulin and do not get suppressed, and hence there is inappropriate increase in glucagon. This vicious cycle continues, aided by the fact that medical professionals fail to recognize that a person with high glucagon, high sugar output from the liver, should not be treated with a carb diet. Okay, so I've juxtaposed these two together to tell you this is the normal response on the left. That's the abnormal response with lack of phase one insulin release, lack of suppression of glucagon, and a continual increase in sugar levels. So um, now we come to cholesterol. So despite all of that, I'm not behind time. <laughs> so cholesterol is vitally important for the brain. 25% of the body's cholesterol is in the brain. The brain is only 5% of our body. Cholesterol is so important that the brain does not delegate to the liver to make it. It makes it itself in astrocytes that are supporting cells. And the primary way in which we transport cholesterol in the brain is through ApoE. So ApoE is a protein that gets lipidated by uh, the astrocytes, and it is taking cholesterol to different parts of the neuron. We will explore that a little bit more. So you can inherit one of three polymorphic forms of ApoE3, so I'm sorry, ApoE, which would be ApoE2 or 3 or 4, one from each parent. 
ApoE4 is perhaps more of a hunter-gatherer type of uh, polymorphism, and it is more susceptible to cleavage. Uh, it can get cleaved at a certain site and form fragments. So the native population is a little bit more representative of ApoE4. More ApoE4 are found in those groups compared to an agricultural society. And I think I saw Dr. Eads out there because I borrowed his idea out here to entertain you. Because I think Dean Ornish traveled back in time <laughs> to advise these guys to eat a carbohydrate-filled diet so that they could evolve into ApoE2. So what does cholesterol do in the brain? The synaptic connections between brain cells need cholesterol. The neurotransmitters are in, neuro, are in synaptic vesicles, and these are cholesterol-rich areas of the brain. The insulin receptor is in a cholesterol-rich domain. So insulin receptor, important for the brain, is aided in its performance by areas that are cholesterol-rich. The neurotransmitter receptors sit in lipid rafts that are cholesterol-rich. In fact, ApoE is so important in supplying cholesterol because it's needed for neuron growth, for microtubule stability, to clear amyloid. Now, if ApoE is important in the brain, what is it doing in the rest of the body? And I did not know this, and if there are health professionals who knew this, I would applaud them, that the body absorbs carbohydrates and protein very differently than it deals with fat. So amino acids and sugars go through portal circulation to the liver to get processed. Whereas fat is put into chylomicrons, it bypasses the liver through the thoracic duct and gets into the general circulation. What happens after that? It goes to the, through the blood vessels to fat-filled cells and out there, lipoprotein lipase, which is an insulin-dependent enzyme, unpacks the chylomicron and dumps the fat into the fat cells as long as they are healthy, or lets it be used by the muscles. So once it is delipidated, once it's dropped off its cargo, then it becomes a chylomicron remnant. So the liver is designed to deal with the chylomicron remnant. On the right of the slide is showing the fat-filled chylomicron dropping off its cargo in the fat cells, in the muscles, becoming the chylomicron remnant. The HDL, one of its primary purposes is to carry ApoE. And it donates an ApoE to a chylomicron remnant so that it can be cleared by the liver. So the liver is responsible for clearing the calomicron remnant, which is cholesterol rich. How well you clear this calomicron remnant depends on whether you are ApoE2, 3, or 4. If you are ApoE4, you, the liver basically sucks up the calomicron remnants very quickly. It doesn't do it well if you are ApoE2. It's somewhere in the middle for ApoE3. This point is important, so I created another slide. And this shows that ApoE4 basically sucking up the cholesterol and the calomicron remnant into the liver. The ApoE2 is pretty bad at it, and the ApoE3 is somewhere in between. I think that Dean Ornish advised the ApoE3 people to evolve like that. So if it's happening in the liver, wouldn't you think that it's also happening in the brain? But the cholesterol has been so stigmatized that we think that cholesterol is bad. So nobody has actually really looked into this. So we don't know this information, whether cholesterol that is so important to the brain whether ApoE4 people transfer that cholesterol into their neuron cells very good like they do in the liver. But we do know this, 
that ApoE4 individuals are pretty smart. Because if you take a cohort of college graduates, probands, a higher percentage of them are ApoE4 as youths compared to the other Apo lipoprotein E's. If you look at cognitive skills, the number of correct answers on cognitive tests, the ApoE4 people perform better compared to non-ApoE3. And to the chagrin of people who want to drive the LDL down, if you had a high LDL, you also perform well on cognitive tasks. So, <laughs> I want a bit of forgiveness here. I'm completely apolitical, and I hope that uh, Jeff, I don't know if he's around here, he's right there, whether he'll throw me out. <laughs> we all know that Ivor is super smart, and I'm paying him a tribute here. He's young and intelligent and has ApoE4. And with age, can a person like him get incurable dementia? So please forgive me for this. I'm doing this only because I want to entertain you. <laughs> so it's perhaps insul insulin resistance that predisposes an otherwise healthy phenotype like ApoE3 to dementia. I think nature never anticipated that we would have so much carb ingestion that we would have refrigerators, supermarkets, bakeries. Now, I was talking to Shaban, and she gave me some good pointers for this talk. Amyloid, the ApoE3 receptor, insulin, these are all membrane proteins in the brain, and they interact with each other inside the brain. The amyloid is an important protein that is involved in neuron growth. And like Shuban told me, it attracts white blood cells so that the brain can protect itself from infections, from viruses and bacteria. So amyloid beta is a breakdown product of amyloid precursor protein. And in an insulin sensitive state, it's rapidly cleared. But if you are insulin resistant, because the cell is energy starved, the amyloid beta forms amyloid beta oligomers. It clumps together, and that destroys the connection between our brain cells. So years of refined carb, hyperinsulinemia, insulin receptor downregulation, defective insulin signaling inside the brain, reduced amyloid beta clearance, increased accumulation inside the brain cells, destroying your synapses, and taking away your memory. Now, I put this slide up on Twitter so that if I don't explain it well here, you can understand it. But all I'm trying to tell you here is that apolipoprotein E4 does not remove the amyloid beta through the blood-brain barrier as well as apolipoprotein E3 does, because it interacts with more receptors at the blood-brain barrier, removing it into the blood where it is digested by proteases. What is more, the ApoE4 individuals, they trap more insulin receptors in containers called endosomes, like we have described, because I think nature felt that this is a hunter-gatherer. He does not need as many insulin receptors. So why is it important for you to know whether you are ApoE4? Because I think that it tells you that you are designed more for an ancestral diet rather than a standard American diet, that you are designed more to do fasting, that you are designed to be physically active. It also helps you provide an alternative fuel for the brain, which is the ketone bodies. But all medicine can focus on is because they have a higher LDL, and I cannot get into the mechanisms as to why they have a higher LDL, to statinate these people, to give them mega doses of statins. But they are missing the most important modulating factor that causes their dementia and heart disease, which is insulin resistance. 
So APOE4 people, if they become insulin resistant, are perhaps three to four fold higher risks of getting heart disease and 11 to 24 fold higher risks of getting dementia. So if you take a metabolically unhealthy insulin resistant patient, they have insulin receptor downregulation, they have loss of phase one response, the paracrine modulation and control between insulin and glucagon is lost. They're catabolic, they're losing lean muscle mass. They are spewing fat from their fat cells, but they are putting it into the viscera, into the pancreas, into the heart, and into the blood vessels. And what's more, they're getting insulin resistant in the brain and getting demented. So the important thing here is to recover, repair, and repopulate your insulin receptor. To restore the insulin-glucagon interaction, the parachronology that Dr. Roger Unger was talking about, and this group is best at doing it because the there is no medical therapy, there's no drugs you can take to do this. You earn it the old heart way, old fashioned way, by fasting, by severely restricting carbs in somebody who is metabolically unhealthy, and by improving insulin sensitivity with exercise. So this is Dr. Tro, he's doing low carb New York, and he has transformed himself and become insulin sensitive and healthy. And here I'm being a little bit of a heretic because I'm standing here as a low carb advocate and I'm telling you, maybe we need to think about a paradigm in which we cyclically activate our insulin receptor. Because when we do that, we build new protein, we improve the connections between our brain that makes us smarter, and I don't know if in Tro's case, whether he can get any more muscular and any more smarter than he already is. But the question that I want to leave you with is that should we activate our insulin receptor periodically? And if so, how often, how intensely, and with what? Is sugar the right fuel? Should we consider using low glycemic index fruit or high glycemic index fruit? Is protein alone enough if you are a carnivore? So these are questions that I think that the low carb community should be open to and try to answer. So this is my final slide. And what I dream of is that, like Ivor has Bobbert and many of you have uh, Andreas, that some philanthropist will come and tell me, hey, I want to give you resources because we want to, you to stop doing what you're doing and become a full-time researcher to answer these questions. So with that, I thank you for the indulgence and uh, I'm honored to be a part of this group. Thank you. Thank you.